While the story of the mass internment of Japanese Americans in California, Arizona, Oregon, and Washington has been well documented over the years, very little is known about the Hawaii internees, and even less is known about the confinement sites located in Hawaii. In 1885, larger numbers of Japanese began to immigrate to Hawaii to work on the sugar plantations. They came in search of a better life. By 1920, Japanese immigrants and their children made up 40% of Hawaii's population. For many of the Issei or first generation, the dream of a better life was coming true. but there were dark clouds gathering over the islands. The Nationality Acts of 1790 and 1870 restricted Japanese immigrants from naturalization. In 1922, the Supreme Court case Ozawa versus the U.S. denied the Issei U.S. citizenship. The ruling stated that Japanese immigrants were ineligible for citizenship because they were not of the Caucasian race. The military examined the Japanese menace in Hawaii, and they concluded that they couldn't identify those who would be, quote, loyal to the U.S. or disloyal to the U.S. At the same time, the FBI was also gathering intelligence on the Japanese in the islands. The FBI created the Custodial Detention List. It became the initial list used to arrest the Japanese in Hawaii for internment. Tensions rose between the U.S. and Japan, and the possibility of war loomed. But in Hawaii, the Japanese immigrant Issei and their children, the Nisei, went about their daily lives. I come from a family of nine, including my grandpa, whom we call ji -sang, and six of us children. Life was quite peaceful and very quiet because this was in Haleiwa. My dad became a tailor. We were not rich, but we were not poor. And we had a good life. Otoki Chiyosaki came to Hilo in 1917 at the age of 12. And then in 1924, I believe, he uh, was asked to teach at a Japanese language school, which he did. And uh, he did that and was uh, very well liked by his students. Well, my husband's name was Kuniyaki Nishioka. And then for the convenience of living in America, he was nicknamed Bob. And when he was 12 years old, his father decided to pull up stakes and return back to Japan. And when he came back to Hawaii, it was 1939. And he had just gotten into UH. Then the war broke out. I still remember that morning, 7.50. I was at dormitory, mid-pack. All of a sudden, music stopped. This is a war entire Hawaiian island under enemy attack. Martial law was soon declared. Martial law means military control of a particular territory within the U.S. and that civil liberties or the Constitution is suspended. On December 7, 1941, arrest squads were mobilized. The War Department ordered the arrest of all names on the FBI custodial detention list. So as the smoke still rose from Pearl Harbor, these squads went to various districts in Hawaii, not only on Oahu, but all the other islands, locating those people to arrest them. 
From my research, there were 391 individuals who were arrested in Hawaii between those two days. And most of the Kocho Sensei, the principals of Japanese schools, and senior teachers were rounded up. Men who had status, business leaders or physicians. Buddhist and Shinto priests were another large group arrested on December 7th and 8th. Over half the names on the custodial detention list were volunteer consular agents like the Reverend Tamasaku Watanabe, or those performing consular duties like the Reverend Paul Osumi of Kauai. The primary traits were leadership in the Japanese communities. Most marvelous kind of account of that was this publisher, Soga Yasutaro, and he describes how hearing the news of Pearl Harbor, it filled him with dread. Towards the evening, he got ready. He said he expected something to happen. He had his shoes on and everything when three agents knocked at his door and they just said, come with us. And he said, where am I going? And they're not gonna tell him. They weren't gonna tell him. And his wife, he says, as she went out the gate, whispered in his ear, don't catch a cold. And Soga then was put into this car and there were other people and it's, they stopped along the way to pick up others. And he said the streets were all dark and deserted and there were sentries posted at various places and taken to the immigration station, relieved of all of his personal belongings and then shoved upstairs into this room, which is dark, and he couldn't see anything. Soga fumbled around in the darkness and eventually found a place to sleep. He realized there were a large number of men locked in the room with him. On the Big Island, Otokichi Ozaki experienced a similar fate. So he was picked up. Uh, the FBI agent said, you might want to bring some clothes with you because you may be gone for three or four days. So he was put into a paddy wagon, and uh, one by one, other men would join him in the paddy wagon, and then they took them to Kilauea military camp. He said the only thing that he was allowed to bring to the camp was his keys, his wallet, a handkerchief, and a sweater. Everyone outside! Move! Move into the middle of the road! And then the very next day, they were lined up, and he didn't know what was going to happen to them. He saw the guards with their guns, and he thought they might be shot. But it turns out that they were going to be um, led into the cafeteria to be uh, fed. This time was very bewildering. They really did not know what was going to happen to them. Uh, they didn't know if they were going to be alive the next day. There were about 112, and uh, they stayed there for about 72 days before being shipped off to Honolulu. In the morning, he recognized people as the leaders of the community, his friends. Move! Move! Go! He said these soldiers were young kids, you know, and a lot of them were quite nervous, actually. But they ordered them around with those bayonets pointing at them. And he said, we would have died a dog's death, a dog's death, had we sort of answered back. All Oahu internees were first processed through the U.S. Immigration Station. Both Soga and Ozaki wrote about the poor living conditions during the early days of the war. He also said that they had to eat after the German and Italian detainees who ate first and then dumped their mess kits in these buckets of water. So by the time the Japanese ate, they had to grab those from that. It's like a slop can. So he felt kind of sickened by the uh, greasy utensils that he had to use. They had to share coffee cups. You know, it's demeaning of their uh, dignity. These were the leaders of the community, you see. And that's the kind of treatment given to the leaders, which was then a lesson to the rest of the population, you see. 
There are 13 known sites used for the internment of the Japanese in Hawaii during World War II. Some of them housed only one or two internees. Others held up to several hundred. The Sand Island Detention Facility was quickly opened on December 9, 1941. Internees lived in tents for six months until barracks were built. And they would bring over the ones who were held on the neighbor islands to the main facility at Sand Island. Mr. Ozaki was in a total of about eight different camps throughout Hawaii and the mainland. And he said that by far Sand Island was where he received the worst treatment. In one of the best accounts, a written account by the journalist Yasutaro Soga, you really see, especially at Sand Island in the immediate aftermath of Pearl Harbor, the tensions were very high, conditions were very harsh. A spoon is missing from the mess hall. You all know the rules of this camp. You are to have no metal objects on your person. The person who has the spoon, step forward now. If no one will step forward, you will all be searched. Sergeant. Sir. Strip search the prisoners. Yes, sir. You heard the captain! All clothes come off right now! Move it! Right now! Move it! Take your clothes off! Drop it right at your feet! Let's go! Move it! Move it! The misplaced spoon was later found in the mess hall. President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 on February 19, 1942. The order led to the mass removal and incarceration of 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry on the U.S. West Coast. Franklin Roosevelt, in 1936, writes this memorandum inquiring of military intelligence what plans did they have to control the Japanese in Hawaii. And he used the words, it occurs to me that we can put U.S. citizens and Japanese citizens alike into concentration camps. So that's five years before Pearl Harbor was attacked. Unlike the U.S. mainland, Hawaii avoided a mass internment of the Japanese population. Arrests and selective internment continued on into 1942. Harry Urata was a Nisei language school teacher. One day, Urata was called out of democracy class at Mid-Pacific Institute. Are you Urata? Harry Urata? Yes. He was arrested on the spot. Kuniaki Bob Nishioka was also a Japanese language school teacher. Then after the war started, everything was shut down, no more Japanese school, and he was working at the supermarket when he was picked up by the FBI. Sam Nishimura, the tailor from Haleiwa, was also visited by the FBI. They went into my room and um, opened all the drawers. And I said, what are you looking for? They didn't answer. They just searched all over the house. And then they took my dad away. That's what I remember about that day. Nishimura's wife was left to care for six children. Nishimura was arrested because prior to World War II, he co-signed a banknote for a truck, which was sent to the Japan Red Cross. About 800, maybe a little more, were sent to internment camps in the continental United States. These were almost entirely Issei. And over the course of the spring and summer of 42, 10 shiploads of Issei took these men uh, from Sand Island to these uh, various internment centers in the continental U.S. Soga, Ozaki, and Watanabe would all eventually end up in the Santa Fe internment camp. On some transport ships headed to the mainland, there were two types of Japanese passengers. But also, the soldiers were prisoners because they had no choice. They 
had to prove their loyalty to the U.S. When Sand Island closed in March of 1943, uh, those who were left, which were almost entirely Nisei, were transferred to the Honolulu Uli camp. Most of them, at least initially, were Kibe, that is Nisei, who were born in Hawaii and thus U.S. citizens, but who had been educated in part in Japan. And for various reasons, that group was deemed the most suspect by U.S. authorities. Honolulu Uli also held a number of local Germans and female internees. Honolulu Uli was totally barren then. It was huge. And then there were some tents, and that's where my parents were, in tents. Internees called the area Jigoku Dani, which means Hell Valley. How come I'm not staying inside here? Although I am American citizen, we are there under suspicion. You know, they just suspect us. Then they have a dining room, everybody get together, wife and children, the internees get talking. Don't forget, study hard for school, because school is important, yeah? But don't forget, take care of your brothers and sisters, yeah? And I remember somebody explaining that he is not a prisoner, he is an intern. And I thought, well, what is the difference? Because, you know, the Pop isn't at home. I just wanted to see him. When are you coming back? I'll be back as soon as I can. All right? Nishimura's wife asked to move into a mainland internment camp so the family could be together. And all of a sudden, in January, everything stopped. And then he was released on January 19th, so he came back. Sam Nishimura was released after nearly two years of internment. In 1943, the Reverend Paul Osumi was now incarcerated at the euphemistically named Gila River Relocation Center. My father came down with what is called valley fever, and he got really sick. A family friend wrote to Osumi's wife in Hawaii about Paul's condition. They were worried he might pass away. Osumi's wife and children voluntarily entered Gila River. As soon as my mother and my brother and I landed up in Gila, he started to get better. I guess it gave him a lot more encouragement with uh, the family there with him. Otokichi Ozaki's wife and children also entered into a mainland internment camp. After a year of living in separate internment camps, the Ozaki family was finally reunited at Jerome, Arkansas, and then the Tule Lake Incarceration Center in California. Also headed to Tule Lake were a group of 67 internees from Honolulu, Uli, which included Harry Urata and Bob Nishioka. They put us in a stockade. They watch how we, we want to do, you know, react. Bob first met Shizuye at Tule Lake. Three months later, they were married. But then, of course, you know, we were married in camp. And then um, we had no idea when the war would be ending. In December of 1944, the government rescinds the exclusion order after the Supreme Court decision ex parte endo. The decision stated that loyal citizens could not be lawfully detained. Internees were allowed to return to the West Coast in January of 1945. Bob Nishioka never returned to live in Hawaii. He and Shizuye settled in California after being released. On Sunday, September the 2nd, 1945, the most horrible war in history came to its complete and formal end. Foreign Minister Shigemitsu signed for Japan. When war ended, then I made my my mind, I gotta do something for America. Urata then taught Japanese to the military intelligence service. He returned to Hawaii and became a successful music teacher for 53 years. The Nisei veterans of the 100th, 442nd, and MIS 
returned and helped to reshape the future of Hawaii. However, for the Hawaii internees, their return was not as celebrated. You know, if you were one of these thousand or so who were thrown in camp, you must have been guilty of something. So I think there was the, the stigma that a lot of these families carried around that they didn't want to talk about. When his friends came, you know, they never came during the day, they just came during the night to see him. When I asked him why, why he didn't talk about it and why his kids didn't know about it, he said that for the longest time he was really angry. He was angry at the government for taking him. And then when he came back, he was angry at people who came to see him because they had to sneak and see him. Soga returned to Hawaii in 1945 and resumed his work at the Nippu Jiji newspaper, now called the Hawaii Times. Ozaki returned to Hawaii and also worked at the Hawaii Times. In later years, he became the general manager. Osumi and his family moved to Oahu he became well known for his newspaper column. He wrote a column for the Honolulu Advertiser, which was called Today's Thought. Although he was a Christian Protestant minister, um, he was not really quoting the Bible or anything. He was just giving people simple daily thoughts of how to live a happy life. In 1952, the Issei were allowed to obtain U.S. citizenship. Many of them finally became naturalized citizens. They wanted to just kind of blend in and be part of this, this change that was going on in Hawaii. So I think there was this real incentive to just kind of bury this part of the story. In the 1970s, Japanese Americans began a movement to seek redress from the federal government. Groups of uh, Japanese Americans throughout the West Coast primarily sought to question the, the legality of their internment. In 1980, Congress and President Carter approved the creation of the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. The Commission's 1983 report acknowledged the injustice of the mass removal and incarceration of Japanese Americans. In 1988, President Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act. Former internees received a letter of apology from the President and $20,000 in compensation. Years passed, and the stories brought out by the redress movement began to fade into memory. In 1998, the former site of the Honu'uli'uli internment camp was rediscovered by the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii. The archeological element was another key thing that occurred in the last few years. And so I uh, applied for a grant to come out to Hawaii and look for all the internment sites. And working with the JCCH, we went to all the sites. The Sand Island internment camp is just about completely obliterated. But now it's like a big industrial park and there's really nothing left. Today, the immigration station is used by the Department of Homeland Security. It's almost just like it was during World War II. On Kauai, there were four internment sites that we know of so far. The Lanai Jail, County Jail, and Courthouse are still intact. They still look like they did in World War II. On Maui, there were two sites that we know of, Haiku Camp and Wailuku Jail. Again, we don't have any maps or photographs of it, so we don't know exactly where it was, but we do have a couple of oral histories that kind of describe it in relation to some of the features that are still there. The Kilauea military camp on the Big Island has buildings almost exactly the way they were during World War II. The buildings that were used to house the internees, to imprison the internees, are still present. Archaeology and research continues to be conducted primarily at Honu'uli'uli, the largest of the internment camps in Hawaii. Volunteers have also come out to assist with the archaeology. Some of them are descendants of the former internees.
I knew very little about my grandfather's internment. Um, it wasn't a subject that was brought up and it wasn't something that was talked about often. To think that my grandfather went through it and that he didn't talk about it, I find that that's just amazing. That, you know, he could have gone through something, something like that and not ever complain about it. I find that remarkable. And uh, the visit to the Gulch was quite emotional. Having the sites available for people to really look at, think about, visit, provides a really concrete way in which people can say, okay, racial profiling, whether it's after 9-11 and it's Middle Eastern people or Sikhs or uh, people with turbans or whatever, who we think might constitute an imminent danger to the United States and the use of torture and all of those kinds of things. It seems to me those are things that we need to really, really carefully think about. For the United States, their intent was to protect their citizens. I think what they forgot was that these were their citizens. But I think people's experiences have to be talked about and delivered so that maybe we can minimize that discrimination. There are some who say, well, why, why talk about it? I think we should if only to remind ourselves that this can happen in our democracy if we're not vigilant, because it did. Efforts are ongoing to preserve the Hono Uli Uli internment camp and open it to the public as a historic site. A special resource study of the other 12 Hawaii confinement sites was recently announced. Many of the sites have faded into distant memory. Untold stories of the Hawaii internment experience and the people who lived through them continue to be discovered.